share today, but I, I, I feel this is such an important uh, parable, the parable of the sower. And it's a parable that we're all familiar with. Um, but I want you to consider, do you, have you ever agonised over the state of people's hearts? We watched a uh, Matthew 13, verse 1. Um, we watched a part of a video yesterday that we've seen before called um, Future, of Future of Food. Yeah. Hmm. And it is the most disgusting movie I've ever watched because it talks about Monsanto. <laughs> How they basically bought every seed company mm -hmm. that they could get their hands on. They've patented every genetic seed yep. known to man. And basically they're saying, if it blows onto your property, if we plant it there, if it gets there by any shape or form, and we find it on your property, we will sue you. And they have. They are all over the All over the world, they're suing yeah. people. And taking their properties off them. Then. Yeah, I know. That's all their plan is, really. The, these are farmers who've been out there breeding their seeds for generations. And they're releasing the seed on purpose. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Hiring people to go out and release the That's seed. That's what this guy said that the, the truck went past his property, and his neighbour said he dropped enough seed, he had a broken tarp on his truck, he dropped enough seed to sow 2,000 acres. And yeah, oh. do it on purpose. And it's into his granola, his canola seed. And now he can't replant his own seed because his seed's contaminated. And he knows, his, uh, his lawyer said if he plant it and they find it on your property, they'll, like the one they'll see it and that's what they're doing. And it, uh, I said to Christine, how, where does man get the ego that he thinks that he can Do claim as his own something that he's had no part in producing? Mm. Exactly. How can you take food, which is God's provision for humanity, and say, this is now mine. It doesn't belong to God. This is now mine. I'm claiming this is mine. I'm going to charge you for the privilege of using it. And so uh, it, it ties in with, with the parable of the sower. It says, uh, chapter 13 of Matthew, verse 1. The same day went Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside, and great multitudes were gathered together under him, so that he went into a ship and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow, and when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up, because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But others fell into good ground, and brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. And the disciples come to him later, and they say, Can you explain what this parable is about? Um, and he goes in verse... Uh, 18, and he starts to pick up, hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. And he says, when one hearing the word of the kingdom, and understandeth, understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one, Satan, and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which receives seed by the wayside. But he that received the seed into stony places, the same is he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receiveth it. Yet hath he no root in himself, but dureth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. He also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word, and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. But he that receives seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth some a hundredfold, some sixty and some thirty. I've been a Christian for over 35 years and 
It troubles me to say in those years I've met all of these sorts of people. People who the sea is put before them and their hearts are just like stone. Just can't penetrate. Then you come to some people and the sea gets planted and they become the most excited, full on, totally into this and within a matter of months you never see them again. Just gone. It's like, how does that happen? How, how do you see this, how do you hear this, how do you take this on board and then as as the roots start to go down, they just there's just no more soil left. They just hit stone further down. And the sun of persecution rises. They come under stress from family and friends. And, and uh, that's it. Done. And then some come in and they, they grow bigger and they seem to be really progressing well. And then life chokes them. Uh, job, pressures, pressures from family, pressures from loved ones to provide, and the deceitfulness of riches. They just get swept up that, that there's more to life than knowing God. There's all this other stuff. The houses, the cars, the ambition, the career. And the word gets choked. We've got a choco vine down there. Tell you what. Takes over, That'll it? just take over everything. You let that have its head and it'll just run. It's like a pumpkin. It'll just run. And um, and this is what this is what these things are like. The stuff of the flesh. And so the end result for that person is they become unfruitful. The plant doesn't have enough time to grow and develop to the point where it can bring forth fruit. And so they never experience that joy of seeing someone come through and experience that fruit in their own life of, of that joy and that peace and that everything that Christ brings with him. But what brings joy to my heart, and I know that it brings joy to God's heart, is when a seed is planted in good ground. And we all have to ask ourselves the question, what sort of ground is my heart? You know, am I a stony ground? Am I a ground with weeds? Are there things in my life that are, are there ready to choke me spiritually? Or is my heart good ground? We also had that DVD, um, Back to Eden, we watched it again yesterday. We've got a, a fellow at the markets who sells um, seedlings, and we gave him Back to Eden, which is... Has anyone not seen Back to Eden? The guy with the wood chips and all that? Um, if you haven't seen it, it's worth seeing. And, um, and he watched it and he, the following week, came up to us, embraced us, was so thankful for it, and now he's changing his farm over to that method. And, that was six months ago. And that was about six months ago. And in two weeks' time he's having an open day at his farm where he's inviting out you know, 20, 30, 40 people to come to his farm and see what a difference it's made on his farm. And he said, and I said to him, oh, would you like us to get some DVDs for you? And oh, he said, that would be fantastic, you know, then they can take it home and watch it. Mm -hmm. Well, all the way through this DVD, the guy who's mm -hmm. the main guy, he's, he's just sharing Christ mm -hmm. all the way through. Yeah. He's quoting scripture after scripture. So now we've got this chap, not even a Christian, he's out there witnessing, giving out these testimony of this guy and his relationship. And, and this guy's testimony about the way he came to this understanding was that God just said to him, go, go, go out in the forest and see that no one's you know, doing anything out there and all my trees are growing, everything's growing out there quite happily and no one's cultivating, no one's doing anything to it to improve it. Um, and so he shares about this, this good ground, he was so thankful now that it's just so easy now. You know? He just plants his seeds. And Gets and he, better every year. He, he can put it in the same spot year after year and he gets a higher yield every year because the way that he's building the soil is just uh, taking over and, and minimal weeding, basically no watering. 
and um, having amazing results. And these two girls came out to his farm and, and uh, wanted to do a movie about him. And uh, he'd never done soil tests or anything like that, pH, all that stuff. And they came out and they did all these tests and of course his stuff was right you know, the top thing that it was meant to be. And he said, I, I don't add anything, I don't do anything. It's just the way it works. And I, I think I'm sharing this this morning because when Gavin came in, um, I guess for me, when people come to Christ, my first thought in my mind is, what's your heart? Are you a rocky heart? You know, are you a thorny heart? Are you a good ground? Time will tell. And, uh, and Gavin came and shared his, how excited he was, and I'm tearing up now just thinking about it, because it, it blesses my heart when you can see evidence that these things are taking root and that God is there cultivating. How, how many times does Jesus tell parables where, you know, well, here's this tree and it's not doing very good and the husband says, well, why, why is it covering the ground? Why is it taking up space? And Jesus says, oh, look, just give me one more year. Let me just, you know, work it a little bit better. And give me one more year and if, it, if we don't get the result, then I'll pull it out. And... Um, and that's what he does. He just keeps working on us, you know. And uh, and and also I look at like Rob and Sharon and others who come along, and and you can see over the course of the last six months with Rob, and seen some of the struggles going on in his head and his heart. And yet he, I know that he's fixed in his purpose, but then something happens, and it's like, oh, what a breakthrough! You know, there's a breakthrough. There's a breakthrough. And you know that his heart is good ground, you know, because this seed is taking root. And there might be some resistance to some stuff. Some. Yeah. <laughs> We're all there. Um, and we've all been through it. Our own stuff that we're resistant. But the, um, the gardener knows, and he just keeps working it. So, Gab, we're over to you, mate. Mate, there's a blessing here that we're all going to enjoy. It's funny because that what, what we just read then was exactly what me and my mum have been talking about all week. Right. That's always been my favourite part in the, the, this Jesus movie that I've watched in my whole life. And it's funny that you read that bit because that mm. all week that's what we've been talking about. Um, well, this what, is... I, what I told everyone a bit about this morning was, was really just my what happened to me this week. I just had the most amazing week of my life. You're going to say it again? Without a doubt. I'll, I'll, I'll get to that. I might just tell my, my other story. Um, I've been tired of it, uh, God's gift. And even though it's a, it's a summary of the 35 years <coughs> that I've experienced, but really it's, it's a story uh, about God, not about me. Okay. Um, I was born on the 25th of November, 1977. Uh, just up the road, out in the Woolen Bar. Uh, when me and mum came back from the hospital, we moved into our brand new house on my grandparents' farm at Upper Barringbar, along with my dad, my brother and my sister. I have no memories of the whole family being together at the house. Mum tells me I did three days of preschool, came home, threw my bag at the wall and refused to ever go back. <laughs> mum and dad fought a lot, at the time, especially about Mum's newfound spirituality. Dad left when I was five and built his house on the other side of the, the 460-acre property. Uh, mostly Mum raised me and my brother and sister. She tried her best, she tried her best to show us uh, veganism and, and after some uh, dabbling in the occult, also Christianity. We mostly rejected this uh, as the rest of our family would, would lure us with junk food and, and other ideas against Christianity. I loved growing up on the farm and was free to run the countryside. I began to enjoy primary school and breezed through becoming first in my class every year. Teachers would talk about how I could go on to do anything academically. At first I struggled going from a small country town primary school of 100 
children to the second biggest high school in New South Wales with 1,600 children. I felt a little overwhelmed but still performed well academically and made, made a lot of new friends. Then when I was 14, something happened that would change my life forever. I was bushwalking up the back of our farm in the forest, which was a, a usual thing that me and my brother would do. When I came to a clearing on the property next door that was set up like a garden, I realised what I was looking at was a marijuana crop that I had heard a lot about in, in our area. I decided to take some and then took it to school with me to get some other opinions from friends. Before long I was smoking it, eating it, selling it and growing it myself. My schoolwork slipped, but my new business started to take off. At 15 I met, <coughs> met the love of my life. It was alcohol. The first time I got drunk I felt amazing. It made me feel like the person I had always wanted to be. I knew I had to try and get more whenever I could. Me and my friends would get older siblings or friends to get it for us and drinking became a regular occurrence every weekend. Meanwhile, my dad had remarried and moved away. I became close with my new stepbrother and soon he became my partner in crime with the business and we began stealing to make extra money as well. My mum also remarried and moved away. But I pleaded to stay at the house on my own as my brother and sister had, had, were older, they had finished school and had already left home. Mum got it in and at 16 I had a really big house all to myself. I went to school to tell my friends of the news and the non-stop party began. By the time my final exams for the HSC came around, I was doing dope and drinking almost every night. My mind was starting to function differently and I could no longer concentrate. I spent two hour exams mostly just drawing pictures on the front cover. I couldn't wait to finish school. And then, then came the first bombshell. I heard that my stepbrother had gone missing. I, I said I knew, <clears throat> knew nothing of where, where he might be as I was his closest friend. But I had a sinking feeling inside. But I had a bad idea what may have happened. He was always troubled. He struggled at school and couldn't make friends. And as, as in my troubled mind, I knew he was troubled also. To, after two weeks of being missing, <clears throat> My dad found him hanging from a rope in the van of the barn, down the road from that house. Everyone was gutted. And I couldn't help thinking it was my fault that I should have done something. After that I could never enjoy dope again. The last time I did it, a friend found me in a broom closet, curled up, sweating shaking and not knowing where I was or even who I was. So I returned to my other master, alcohol. <clears throat> I went on to do two years of hospitality at TAFE, but I'd lost my motivation and my mental state was getting worse. I didn't know what to do with my life. And my brother suggested that because I love TVs and stereos, using the movies. I should do something in that area. I thought it was a good idea, so I moved to the Gold Coast and did a six month retail course which ended with two weeks of work experience at Chandler's Electrical Finance School. I loved it straight away and put in a huge effort and after the, my third day of work experience they offered me a job. Soon I started working casual at, at three different Chandler stores and felt like I had a family again and that I belong to something special. My friends were even bitter. They all disliked their jobs, and here I was raving about how good my job was, and I was getting more money than, than everyone else. It was like a game to me. Selling was easy, it was just an extension of lying, which I excelled at. 
even fellow salesmen would come up to me after I talked an old couple in an extended warranty they couldn't even afford and say, how can you lie like that? I would simply laugh and say, that's what we get paid for. So now I've bought all new clothes and new car and new furniture, and best of all, whatever alcohol I wanted. But after two years, things went bad for the company and the stores began to close or get new owners. I decided to head back home to the farm for a while as I knew an opportunity was going to come up with one of my former managers soon. Six months of drinking later, I got a call that my old manager was, was starting a, a good guy's store at South Toy Heads and wanted me as a department manager. I packed my bags and headed back to the Gold Coast. But this time things were different. Something in my mind had changed. I lasted six weeks when I was overcome with anxiety and depression. I left without a trace and fled back to the farm to, to try and recover. I couldn't understand what was happening to me. All I could do was to drink, drink away these strange feelings. Months, months later, a call came from the owner of one of my old channel stores. He wanted me to go back there to work and I felt ready to give it another try. It felt a little strange at first, but then I had my old rhythm back in no time. I lasted two years, and I moved house and took two years off work, which of course I spent drinking. When I went back to work, I walked in the back door and came in. I suddenly didn't know what I was doing. I was gripped with fear and fled back home, where I called in sick and collapsed in bed. The same thing happened the next day and I had to confront my boss and tell him my problems. He was very understanding and suggested I move to our tweet head store as it's quieter and less stressful. This solution seemed to work, but I knew something was wrong and it wasn't going away. Meanwhile, I was ten attending a friend's party, now 25 years old, when I met a beautiful young girl. I'd had just enough alcohol to have the courage to approach her, but not enough to have scared her away. It was love at first sight. I had never been in love before except with alcohol. We hit it off right away and within four weeks she moved in with me. But just as we began to make marriage plans, the cracks began to appear. She couldn't believe that dope was the only drug I'd ever had. And that I was happy to drink alcohol. We began to go to dance parties, which I hated since my musical passion was strictly heavy metal. But I began to soften, soften up once I was introduced to what became my new life. Huge amounts of speed, ecstasy and cocaine. I felt amazing again, but it wouldn't last long. I thought I'd been through some tough times, but the downward spiral was just beginning. My mind was falling apart. Alcohol and drugs every night until I could no longer keep my job. I spent my last days sitting in a store and trying to pull myself together, but I couldn't do it. I said goodbye to my electrical career forever. It took me a long time to accept that something was badly wrong and I'll probably never work again. Me and my girlfriend had something special. After all, she was the only girl I'd never cheated on, but it wasn't enough. We fought constantly, fueled by drugs and alcohol, and after a year, I finally stepped away. I became reclusive, but started searching for an answer to my mental problems. Doctors, psychotherapists, naturopaths, homeopaths, nothing worked. I was put on disability pension and began to see a psychologist once a month. It was hard for others to understand, so I only really talked about it in my mind. Then another bombshell came. My, my ex-girlfriend, who I just split with, <coughs> saw me at a friend's party and ran up to me crying. I asked her what had happened. Just after we'd split, she'd gone to a local deserted beach, something she would never do. She was extremely sensitive and, and would normally would never do things on her own like that. The man jumped out of the bushes and attacked her. She was raped from my point. Once again, 
same as my step, step other situation, it felt like my fault. I should never have pushed it away. It was a painful ordeal. I stayed with her through the police investigation to the trial in the criminal's jail. She's never gotten over it to this day. I was going insane and decided to move back to the coast and do what I did best, alcohol and drugs. This time dealing with drugs as well. <clears throat> My uncle Lance offered me a job helping him at the farmer's market. And although I was worried it would end badly, my psychologist thought it would be a good idea for a rehabilitation. So I gave it a shot and it was definitely a step in the right direction. I even stopped drinking on Wednesday night so I could function better at the market. For the rest of my life, particularly weekends, we were going to go from bad to worse for the next few years. We were getting ready to go out one night when a friend arrived to give us some news. He said I'd better put my drink down and take a seat. He would tell me that my first girlfriend from school when we were 18, who I was still close friends with, had, had died of a heart attack. I was in shock, but the blows kept coming. I was racking up a huge debt with my new gambling addiction, where I would lose up to five or $600 in a session of cane or poker machines. I was drink driving everywhere, which was getting costly. My second court appearance, the judge said next time I would go to prison. This slowed me down a bit, but I still managed to be involved in three car accidents, all of which people said we were lucky to walk away from. I'd stopped getting invites to, to, place, to parties and places, even from close friends, because I was deemed to be too much of a liability due to my growing habit of verbal abuse, fist fights and destroying furniture. But I still managed to do it at our own place. These would be the darkest days of my life. My mental state had deteriorated to a point where I, all I could think about was death. My nights were filled with, with nightmares worse than any horror movie I'd ever seen. Through the day I would imagine all different ways I could be killed. I knew I didn't have the courage to kill myself. It would be too slack to my family. I didn't even know who I was praying to, but every night I prayed to fall asleep and never wake up. Mum had also been praying for me too, but for a different result. Finally, the turning point came on my 30th birthday. I started to feel old and worn out. I wiped myself out as usual and couldn't remember much. A friend said he got up in the middle of the night and saw me standing in the kitchen, tapping carving knife on the bench, staring out the window at the nothingness. He said, what are you doing? But I didn't respond. He said it looked like I was in a deep trance. Monday morning came and as usual my housemates were heading to work as I was heading to the backyard to throw up, saying my usual line, I'm definitely quitting this time. That would always draw a good laugh. But I was ready to try anything. This pain felt worse than death, which didn't seem that far away now anyway, with the condition I was in. Then a breakthrough. My psychologist suggested I see an alternate doctor she knew who was getting results with, with mental illness. I was dubious but went along with it. I went and saw him and ran through a series of questions. He said I would be perfect candidate to, to get the blood work done and there was a good chance he could help with supplementation, but it was, it was very expensive. I decided to go for it. Sometime later, the results came back from the US and I went back to see him. He said my numbers were off the chart, one of the highest readings he'd ever seen, and was amazed how, how normal I acted. I said I can't really remember being any other way now, so I've learned to hide it inside. Then he hit me with it. <coughs> I had not one but two types of, of schizophrenia. At first I thought that sounded ridiculous. That, that's, that's the sort of thing totally crazy people have. Then I thought about my last 10 to 12 years and it made perfect sense. I left the office, I left the office with the most optimism I'd ever felt in my life and started the mega doses of vitamins and minerals straight away. 
things slowly started to change. The voices were quieting down. I could concentrate better, and I felt more confident. The year passed, and I feel feel something was still missing though. Then I asked him if he thought alcohol could be making a difference. He said that other patients drink small amounts and it's okay. Then his eyes widened a bit surprised when I told him the, the amounts I was drinking. He said, well, it's simple. Just stop drinking and see what happens. Yeah, right, I thought. But how could I do that? I decided I had to get serious. I had a taste of a real life again and I wanted more. I moved back to the farm. I moved with my dad. This helped me save money and it kept me away from the action. I was down to just drinking weekends, then started doing full weeks and fortnights without drinking. I had to tell everyone not to call me, I just shut myself away and climbed the walls. It was leaving a massive void in my life and I knew I had to fill it with something. I began going to the beach every day for a run, kayak and swim. This felt good and, and made it easier. Then I began studying nutrition more and switched to a stricter diet without, without any processed food. I would go for a month and crack, then two months and crack, then finally six months before I chose to drink at what would be my, my grand finale. I'd just about beaten it, but I wanted to go out on my own terms. New Year's Eve 2010, I thought I'd just have six beers and stop just to prove to myself that I was in control now. And, and, not, and not the alcohol controlling me. Of course, this was a terrible mistake. The alarm bells were already ringing and I drank the first beer in about 30 seconds. A few friends mentioned that I had the old look in my eye again. Many people over the years would re refer to my old nickname of Jeff on high for a reason. It was too late. <laughs> when all the beer ran out, I hit the panic mode. I rifled through all the cupboards till I came across one of my all-time favourites. She was regal. The bottle that my friend had been saving for a special occasion. Well, that special occasion was there and then. I didn't even have to mix it. By the time I was spotted with a vertical bottle to my lips, it was too late. Everyone knew what was coming next. Some people left there and then, others stayed and witnessed the carnage. After doing some damage at that unit, I proceeded to a neighbour's unit for a fight and eventually retreated to the back of my van to, to sleep off my very lengthy final hangover. The next day I felt hopeless. I accepted that alcohol had a hold of me and I was never really going to be able to quit. I gave up on giving up. I decided to just accept it and go out with a bang. I was a failure. But then something happened. I kept going to the beach and changed to a raw food diet. My cravings started to go away and I began to feel better and think better. At age 32, I read my first book from cover to cover. My mental state had always prevented me from reading properly. Then my mind started to go deeper. I started to think about life again. If I regained my life, what was I going to do with it? All my problems started to fade away and I felt like I did when I was a kid, which was normal. The fog that had clouded my mind for almost two decades had begun to lift. I didn't want to get too ahead of myself, but I knew I'd done it. But something deep down had helped me. I realised something was, was pushing me along because I had actually given up. I spoke with Mum. She didn't seem that surprised. She knew the power of God, and if I let him in, anything was possible. Then a feeling began to grow in me. I began to think, what if it is God giving me a second chance? What if Jesus did come and die for my sins? The least I could do was give it a chance. From studying nutrition, I already believed in creation. And because of my huge respect for my mum, I had a feeling that she was always right about everything. Deep down, I always believed in God, but I buried it so I wouldn't have to face it. But now I had run out of excuses. And this growing inside me, the, the, the feeling growing inside me was getting stronger. I began reading the Bible again, for the first time since I was a kid. 
and watching some DVDs mum had given me. The pieces of the puzzle were starting to fall into place. Then the recent chain of events started. The recent chain of events started that I'd started had confirmed confirmed everything. I haven't read through these last bits as a few mistakes. I met Liz at the market and we became friends. We began to discuss, dis discuss our beliefs and I went with her to Bono and SDA Church. It felt great and I was, it was a real boost to talk to other like minds. But we grew weary of the Trinity talk and I decided I would take a different Sabbath path. But then we met Guy at the last moment and he led us here to home church. Then I realised I actually knew David and Chris from the market. <clears throat> when I first left here on the first day, I told my mum I'd met the most amazing bunch of people in my life and felt like I was part of something really special again. Every Sabbath here is a blessing and helps build my strength. I feel now that God had a plan for me all along. I just needed a long, hard lesson first. I never could have got this high unless I'd hit the rock bottom first. Mm. And as Dave said the other week, spiritually I'm still a baby, and nowadays it's always feeding time. I may not be able to quote Bible verses yet to people, but God has given me a story to tell that might be able to give others hope. As it has turned out when I was 26, praying for death every night, those prayers were finally answered. That person who used to live back then did die. The person here today had to be reborn. Amen. Now the only drug that interests me is love. And there is no room in this vessel for alcohol. It is already overflowing with the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. But my life journey does not finish here. There is still one more chapter to be written. But for that one, I'll have to hand the pen over to God, for He will be the author of my final chapter. So that's the uh, first 35 years. And the other thing I want to talk about was what, what just happened to me this week. Um, after the last Sabbath, I was with um, most people here up at the um, Natural Bridge. And, and all the talks that day really, really touched me. And I left there with a a really strong feeling that, that um, I, I had to do something different and I, I wanted to start really uh, embracing what I, what I want and, and how I feel. But I didn't really know what to do. The, the main thing I thought about was what Blair does, what Blair was saying about with a, with a table and, and giving out DVDs up in Brisbane. Um, but I, I thought I hadn't really got the, the courage or the you know, haven't got the really need to be able to do that sort of thing. But I knew I wanted to do something. Uh, I woke up Monday morning and I felt, felt something I'd never felt in my life, the, the most powerful force that had just, had, had just filled me in my, in my mind. My whole body was just overcome with this feeling and I, and I feel like God gave me the strength and, and he gave me the knowledge of, of what to do. I, most of that day I spent praying. I walked up the back of that property and I just sat and I asked God, just, you, you show me what to do, tell me what to do. Uh, and it started, I, I realised when I used to do Mullen Farmers Market, I used to give out uh, health DVDs to customers. And I realised there's no reason why I can't still do that. I'm now I'm in, the, in a management position at, at Byron Farmers Market. It's, it's the only day of the week I work now because I do a lot of things myself at home and, and thought it was better that I actually leave my, my old career behind because it was, it was getting in the way of bigger things in life. So I realised I just had to ask Mike, the manager, I said, look, can I 
set up with something here where I can give out um, you know, a, a range of DVDs to, to people. And, and before I even set my own story and while I'm doing it, he's already got his head. He said it's, it's free. He said go for it, do whatever you like. So it didn't even take any convincing. So now um, I've got some uh, stand and some different things for my mum. And it looks like probably next Thursday I'll start start doing that. I also was inspired to write this, I just felt, you know, I've got a story, I might as well share it. And the rest of the week I spent going and seeing um, my brother and some other friends who were, who were on a, a fairly dangerous path as well, and, um, and realised I've got to start sharing my message with them and, and, and see what I can do with the, with the little, little bit I've got. But with the huge amount God can give me, I can, I can make a difference one way or another. And at the end, I was pretty excited about coming here. I was, I was incredibly nervous. I I'm, can't do this sort of thing. The best times it reminds me of being in high school in a speech where I'm uh, shaking like a leaf. But, but I knew about to do it because I, I felt pretty strong that it was the, the right thing to do. No, you did it well. Yeah, well. excellent. Yeah. So, pretty good. I don't want to sit down. Got a tear out of man, that's pretty hard. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what, there was plenty of tears writing. Like, there's things in there I haven't, I haven't really um, ever spoken to anyone about. But something was flowing, or well, God was flowing through me, mm. and He helped me write it. Mm. Um, mm. And I just, I just kept writing, I kept crying, I kept stopping, I'd write again. And <laughs> Father, we thank you that we can be here today to share this momentous occasion for Gavin and uh, for us, his family, um, his brothers and sisters who are here to welcome him into this uh, family of God. We're thankful, Father, for the way you've led Gavin in his life and brought him um, from where he was and to where he is today, and the witness that he's going to be to so many people uh, in this area and beyond. And as we open your word, we ask your spirit will just uh, guide us and uh, lead us into truth so that we can understand you better. I pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In Matthew 
uh, chapter 28 and verse 19, one of the uh, last instructions that Jesus gave to his disciples before he ascended into heaven was, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So Jesus was concerned that people need to be taught, they need to understand the things that he had spoken to people to share uh, his ways, and that baptism was like the crossing over point, the point between someone who has no belief to the point where they come into belief, where they come into an understanding of the things of God, and they want to testify to the world and say, I'm, I'm leaving my past life and I'm entering into my new life. And uh, it's interesting that it says to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy, Holy Spirit, or the Holy Ghost. Because when we go into the book of Acts, and uh, we actually see what um, the disciples who had heard that command did, um, I've yet to find anywhere in the book of Acts where they actually baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And people might say, well, why is that? I'll give you just a couple of examples. Here in uh, Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, um, Peter and the disciples had been filled with the Holy Spirit and they went out and uh, started preaching and many people came to hear them and the people were impressed in their hearts that uh, they weren't right with God and they said, what shall we do? And uh, Peter said, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Repent and be baptized uh, in the name of Jesus Christ. And there are several other occasions where the same thing happened, where uh, they came to a group of people who had already received the Holy Spirit, and uh, they looked, Peter said, well, what hinders us from baptizing them? Look, they've already received the Holy Spirit. And so he said, well, we'll baptize you in the name of the Lord. And uh, so there's several instances. So what, what is baptism? What, what is it about? What does it represent? Well, in the book of Galatians, uh, Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, it says that uh, we are crucified with Christ. So we understand that Jesus died on the cross. He was crucified. He gave his life as a ransom. And that term ransom means a corresponding price. So if, say for instance, I said, okay, Amanda's got millions of dollars. I'm going to kidnap Olivia. And I take Olivia and I, I hide her away and I send a ransom note to Amanda and I say, right, I want a million dollars for your daughter. Amanda, if she had the million dollars and she brought me the million dollars, I'd make the exchange. Why is that? Because that's the corresponding price. That's the value that I've placed upon Olivia and that's the price that Amanda's willing to pay. Well, when man, the whole human race, fell into sin, uh, Satan said, well, here's my price. The only thing I'll be satisfied is the, the death of your son. The eternal death of your son. And uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And so this exchange took place where Christ gave his life and rescued the whole race. And so when he died on the cross, he was paying that ultimate ransom price. And in Galatians 2.20 it says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live, yet not me, not I, not self, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, in my body, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So baptism now means that as Gavin goes down into the water, this represents the grave, right? And as he goes down into the water, he's going down in death. He's dying. He's going down into death, eternal death, which is the death of Christ on the cross. And when he comes back up out again, he's coming out in new resurrected life. It's the newness of life, a new, create, a new creature, it says. And uh, so as he goes down, it's, it's goodbye and death to the old life, to the way of the flesh, the way of the world. And he's going to rise up as a new man in Christ. And part and parcel of that process 
even though we can't see it because we can't see the heavenly realm, we can't see the spiritual activity that's going on here, but all around this place now are angelic beings observing, witnessing what's taking place. And there are angels, fallen angels around, who are trying to bring disruption and discord uh, and distraction to what's happening. But when Gavin comes up, there's a, like a mark upon him from that moment on. He's washed clean. And he's now entered into the family of God. Just like when, when I, I married my wife. Be, before I said I do and she said I do, we were two separate individuals. But once we said I do and that, that uh, covenant was made, well, we became one. And that was never to be separated again. And this is what is happening here today. Gavin is making a testimony to not only to God and to us, but to the fallen angels, the unseen worlds around us, that he's making a choice that I'm going down into death. I'm dying to my old self, my old ways, my old habits, my old ways of being. And I'm now going to rise up as a new creature, as a child of God. And forever he will carry that mark. And the promise is, God says, no one can grasp you out of my hand. Once we've entered into that relationship, no one can grasp you out. So I'm going to hand over to Gavin now and let Gavin share the reason why he uh, chose to make this decision and be here today. Thanks, Gavin. Thanks, Dave. Um, first of all, I just want to thank everyone for being here today. I, I wasn't really expecting this many people, so that's made me a little bit more nervous. <laughs> but I'm certainly glad everyone, everyone wanted to be here and, and went out of their way to, to come today. Um, especially my mum and my stepdad came down from Tambourine um, for the day, for the weekend. So, special thanks to everyone. <coughs> um, most of you have already heard my testimony from um, a, a few weeks ago, so I won't go into, into too much detail. But, um, I mean, mo most of my life was, um, was following the wrong path and, um, and was, for about 20 years, was was basically just just living in, in, in total darkness, doing doing all the things that I thought were, were fun and right, but, but they didn't get me the the results or the, the answers I was looking for. So a few a few years ago, I um, made a decision to try and to try and fix up my life, to, to quit um, drugs, alcohol, and manage to get on top of. Um, schizophrenia and, and depression and, and, and other things but I, it still didn't seem like enough I I was um, I was I did feel really good but there was still I knew there was still something missing there was still a, an emptiness inside and I felt like every aspect of my life I'd got it almost back to perfect and I, I really did think I felt like I had an, another chance and I wanted to make the most of that that second chance that I'd been given, and I, I honestly never would have believed that I would have, would have had another chance. I, I thought I was as good as dead for a long time. <coughs> so, uh, thanks to my mum, <coughs> mum planted a seed in, in me, and my brother, and my sister when we were kids. That seed lay dormant for, for a long, long time, decades. But um, about a year ago, that, that seed started, and that seed sprouted and started to grow. Um, I think the turning point about a year ago, I I watched. Um, I started to think about things again, and I, and I thought about this emptiness, and I thought something's missing. There's, there's still a piece of this puzzle that, that's missing. And I had a feeling because of the way Mum had tried to raise us, even though we, we rejected it as kids. I had a feeling that, that mum was right and, and that she had the truth and I had to explore that truth and see if I could find a piece of the puzzle that was, that was still missing to, to see if I could fill the, the emptiness that was still there. So <clears throat> the turning point I think came about a year ago. I went back, I, I started, started, I decided I was going to read the, start reading the Bible again. Um, there was a few few things that happened with, with Guy and Liz who couldn't make it today and all these things seemed to be leading me in a certain direction. I started going to church again. But I went back to this, this old Jesus movie from the Gospel of Luke, which we'd, which Mum had, had, well, 
firstly made us watch when we were kids, but then we did start to enjoy it. We'd watch that Friday night. Um, and I decided to go back to that and just watch it again. And something had changed. And this time I watched it. And I began crying and, and really thinking about the words that Jesus was saying. And, and, it, and, it, and it just hit me. I, just, I knew it was the truth. I could, I could feel it. So <clears throat> I just kept following that path. Um, and I mean, a lot of things happened that, that, that seemed like I kept thinking, wow, there's all these miracles happening. Which led me to here, and, and I knew they weren't just they weren't just luck, and, and they were they were God's miracles. I knew there was there was there was no other way, and I could feel it, and I, I felt it for the last year that, that this is what I not just what I had to do, but what I really wanted to do, and it, and it was the, the the missing missing piece of the puzzle. And I think um, today, I mean, today was an easy decision. I, I've I've been nervous. Uh, for a week and, and really excited and, and it's turning more into this excitement more so than the nervousness because this is I knew this is this is the most important day of my life and, uh, of the life I've had and I, and I know it'll be the most important day of, of the rest of my life and it, it really feels <coughs> feels like a, uh, just it's just a huge uh, honor and, and a privilege to be able to give up my life to die today, to give my life to Christ, I, I never could have imagined that, that I would have the opportunity to do, to do something so amazing, to not just have a second chance at life, but to have a second chance at, at a real life. A, I, I really feel amazingly blessed to, to get this chance. So it's, um, yeah, it was always an easy decision. I, I wanted to, to do this to, to, I guess, make it official. And, to, to give away that old life and and, um, and be, be born again with Christ. Amen. So this is it. Lovely. So uh, when you said that that seed was lying dormant, there's there's only one thing that can make, can make the seed start to grow, and it's not Jim Beam and Johnny Walker, is it? <laughs> No, you can. Uh, that almost like, killed the seed. That almost <laughs> killed the <laughs> seed. Right. <laughs> yeah. So. It's the water of life. That's what makes that seed germinate and, and sprout and start to grow. So it's wonderful, isn't it, that a guy who's so close to being uh, wiping himself out on so many occasions and and uh, to be here today. What a miracle! Mm. Like I said on that little DVD, a, a brand plucked from the fire. Mm. You know, wonderful. Mm. Okay. Warmest taste. <laughs> <laughs> That's not too bad. Yeah, you know, you just keep telling myself. It's usually that quite hard, isn't it? It's just a little bit. It's just a little Bless you, man. We baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord.
Oh,